What's up, guys? Welcome back to Echoing Theology. This is episode six. Uh, today is going to be Monday, the 18th of March, as this drops, but we are recording this on Friday, the 15th, which means St. Patty's Day, by the time this drops, was yesterday. So I hope that you all had a great St. Patty's Day. Um, also, St. Patrick's Day falls on a mass day, so be prudent, please. Uh, but be joyful, be joyful. Uh, I'm extremely excited uh, to get our interviews back in gear. Gianna is welcomed here on Echoing Theology, and I'm extremely excited to have her because her and I have a very, um, we're not in the same class for Echo, but we have a very unique, connect. we have very unique connections, I would say, um, that separate you and I probably from the other people within our two classes, respectively, for Echo. So uh, I'm sure we're going to get into that. But Gianna, welcome to Echoing Theology. Well, thank you for having me, Dale. I was really looking forward to this this week. Well, I'm I'm glad that you said yes, and I'm very uh, grateful. So um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I uh, was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, I went to undergrad at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Um, where I experienced a reconversion in my faith. Um, I was heavily involved in our campus ministry um, at Rutgers. Um, when I was beginning to graduate, I uh, was discerning what my uh, lowercase v vocation was going to be. So like jobs and different things like that. So um, I ended up doing mission work in the Bronx with um, the Seton Teaching Fellows um, for a year. And through that experience of mission, uh, I got an opportunity to study at Notre Dame through Echo. Um, so I, yeah, I worked in the Bronx for a year and now I'm here in Echo. So great. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. Um, yeah, no, that, that's awesome. Also, I love that you're from New Jersey because that is the home of my favorite New York Giants. Yeah. <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know, uh, they actually don't play in New York anymore. They do play in uh, MetLife Stadium, which is in East Rutherford, New Jersey. So uh, go Giants. And uh, no, I, I love I love it. Um, so how did you how did you initially find out about Echo? Well, when I was um, doing mission work in the Bronx, I was it was January and they were starting to put out jobs for the schools that we were, we were doing mission work for, but to, to stay full time. And I was, you know, discerning where I wanted to be because I felt called to teach. Um, but I don't know where I wanted to be, if I wanted to stay in New York or if I wanted to go back home. Um, so they had given us an opportunity. Um, they're, they're the recruiter from scene, given us an opportunity to, um, apply for echo and you know I was like you know like I do want to continue teaching again and when I heard that you would get a a uh not a free master's of theology but like getting a master's of theology at Notre Dame and you know still doing work and still doing um living in community it was just kind of a very like nice package that I was looking for not just studying theology but also putting into practice and work both in my work and in my personal life. Um, I applied, I think, the last day um, they were accepting applications, but Scott Boyle, who's the recruitment director for Echo, uh, gave me, I think, a week to get all of my information together. And I was like, oh, I don't know how this is going to happen, but, you know, God wanted it to happen. So I got all of my letters of recommendation within like a couple of days. I took the the GRE, which I don't think you guys have to take anymore. Um, I took the GRE, um, got, uh, interviews, which I think our class was the last class to do interviews via Zoom. Um, and then I, I got in, I think actually got in, um, this day, like two years ago. I think this, this day, actually March 15th. March 15th. Yeah, that sounds right. It, it's usually within this ballpark. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cause we were, um, we were the 10th was our last day. And then the Echo 21s, shout out to the new Echo 21s, whoever uh, that is. We don't have the list yet. Um, 
or or it's at least not public knowledge yet. Let's yeah. put it that way. Uh, they were the 13th, if I'm looking at the calendar. So it's usually within this ballpark mm -hmm. for sure. Um, what was that? So I do want to go to te uh, your experience with teaching fellows, but what was that experience for you um, having to do the interviews via Zoom? Because you're right, we didn't experience that. And then we also don't take the, the GRE uh, either. Um, the Zoom, the Zoom interviews, I think, have its pros and cons. I, I, I personally really like how they do like live interviews now because you get to see the campus, you get to meet people in person. There's something different about being in person with somebody and doing an interview like that. Um, the Zoom interviews, I, I would say, were very. I mean, obviously, I, I did well because I'm here, but. I um it was it was just different I guess um I really like doing interviews in person it would have been really cool to go to Notre Dame to do that but um the the interview was very low stakes very calm very um yeah very low stakes which I think made me feel a bit more comfortable but if I was at Notre Dame I think it would have I, I just think that in-person interviews are better, but um, I was very um, calm and did well for my interviews. Good. Well, you definitely did well considering you're here. So that's, yeah. <laughs> had, you, had you ever visited the university before? Nope. You got there? Uh, no. Okay. When, uh, when me, my mom moved me to Notre Dame two years ago, that was the first time I've ever been uh, in the Midwest. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. What was your um, what was your experience like when you got to the Midwest? Because I I have family there, so I like every few summers I've always gone to visit. So like, it was kind of always my home away from home. But for somebody from the Northeast, because we're also both from that that territory, what was your experience like landing in the Midwest and seeing like all the flat land and all of that? Um, it was very flat, very flat, but. Funny enough, the the flattest state in the the United States is actually Florida. If you, I don't know if you look at the elevation, the flattest state is Florida, but it was very flat. Um, culturally, it's just very different in New Jersey too. I think that a lot of people in the Northeast are very quick witted, and they're very sarcastic, and there's a certain um. I guess when I move around and do things, there's a certain urgency that I have where it's like in the Midwest, it's very calm. It, there's you know, no rush to things, um, which is something I actually do really appreciate because um, the kind of like go, go, go kind of culture in New Jersey um, yeah. can get a little bit a little bit stressful, especially when you're doing something that does take time. Whereas in the Midwest, it's very slow you can take your time um that's something coming from uh someone in the northeast outside looking in that's something i really appreciate um i will say y'all don't have really good food there i'll be so honest um i remember going to some place i remember going to like a pizza place um in South in South Bend. Bend. i don't know what it is but someone's like oh, Johnny, you have to go there. It's the best pizza place. It's just like New Jersey. And I remember going there and I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's that's kind of like hearing people. Um, I, I know uh, I know Daniel had mentioned to me because he's also from Louisiana um, that like their seafood is really good. So I, I totally get where he's coming from. But yeah. to your point, like, there were people in the Midwest that would tell me, oh, you got to get the seafood here. And I'm like, and the shellfish. I'm like, I come from some of the best seafood in the world. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like, like, uncomparatively. So my standards are going to be a lot higher. Like, like being down in Texas now, when I go back home, right, barbecue, and as you know, barbecue is like throwing a burger on the grill. Yep. A hot dog. That's barbecue. And now being in Texas, my standards are extremely high for barbecue. Yeah. So when I go home now, it's like, no, that's just a burger. That's nothing like, it's nothing special. But no, that's really, really good. Um, I was just curious because I, I, I do hold a special place in my heart for the Midwest. 
but mm -hmm. uh, and 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 I agree with you that that slow pace having patience is real because we do have this mentality being in that cold northeast territory of like we got to go you know uh, we got to shovel and we got to go to work we still got to be to work on time things like that so yeah. it's it's crazy but um, no that's great that's great so tell us a little bit about your experience with uh, Seton Teaching Fellows before you got to Echo. What was that experience like? Um, well, what's actually really funny that you alluded to at the beginning was uh, my mutual, my community member, Emily, um, is your friend um, from Totus Tuis. What's Totus Tuis? Yeah, one of my best friends. Worked with her twice. Um, love you, Emily. I and we have a lot of mutual friends that I worked with in Seton that were your friends. Um, just just happenstance and it was it, it was really really cool because uh emily texted me um i think when you guys were officially got in it's like oh my friend dale is you know he's joining echo um and we were actually i, I was uh your prayer partner so yes yes really um, cool. and i greatly appreciate the uh the kevin bacon plate uh this is an inside joke for us um yeah we know so you and I have connections with Emily, Maddie, Elliot, uh, and a few other people that I know now work in there, uh, you know, like Christine. So um, yeah, really I do leave this plate in my office. So yeah. um, it was in my binder for a while. And I was like, you know what? We're going to bring that to the office. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, I think that's a wonderful program. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things about it. Elliot's still working there as a recruiter. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've heard nothing but good things. I should actually probably reach back out to him at some point soon. Uh, although I'll see him in about eight weeks because we're going to uh, deaconate ordination for three of our friends. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So to, to get to the point with um, my experience in seeing teaching fellows, um, I think the my my year of mission there was definitely the one of the most difficult things that I've ever done it's d difficult in the sense that you really get to see the raw kind of poverty um that some of like you know that the body of Christ experiences um especially in the Bronx uh which is you know historically um socioeconomically poor and like me and Emily in particular work I think in one of the most poorest neighborhoods uh University Heights mm -hmm. um in the Bronx uh in the North Bronx um and I I really attribute to like my own spiritual growth to that year of mission there um I was a first grade catechist um and I taught art and I taught art um and I did uh catechism and just the 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 way that this the service calls you to really take a deep look at yourself and see like the ways that you fail to love the the children that are placed in your care and put in front of you um it's just it was just really um harrowing for me but so much grace and so much grace and growth came from that mission year um i recall a time where I had a student who um he was, he was he was particularly rowdy and I always lost my patience with him. It was just he just wouldn't listen. Uh, especially after like 7 hours of like working with young children and you know the other hour and a half that I had to do after school like the kids were tired, I were I was tired and you know it was just it was just very difficult. So after we had finished work for the day, me and my community went to uh, St. Patrick's um, for a young adult mass. And if you all remember, I think two, a couple years ago, there was like a big hurricane that went through um, New York. Um, it, it was that that particular day. So mm -hmm. I remember going to confession and just feeling so deeply in my heart like the ways that like I have failed to love these children and I, I can't describe into words what specifically came to mind but it was so so deep and profound and but so gentle 
um, that when I went to confession, that was the first time when I went to confession, I bawled my eyes out. I cried and cried and cried. I cried through confession. I cried through mass. I cried for like an hour and a half. But it was that kind of like deep conversion of my heart that allowed me to kind of like change the way that I thought of my mission and change the way that I interacted with my students. Um, so the way that the scene teaching fellows are, um, the way that they are um, trained and formed is through something called love and logic. So it the the basic premise of love and logic is that each student is created with an inherent dignity, and we are called to up hold that dignity which i believe um it it confirms what the catholic church teaches on human human dignity in gaudium et spes so it's not explicitly christian but it has its those those roots in in our in our faith and the way that um we were formed in teaching was to always treat our students with the inherent dignity that they deserve um especially like from my experiences of being a student um both a young student and in college and in high school like I know there were teachers that you know did not treat me like I had dignity mm -hmm. and especially for these young young children that we were teaching there was so much going on in their lives that school was the only constant in kind of safe place that they can be themselves. So they're coming in with so much baggage and so much, um, they're coming in with a lot that we don't see yeah. uh, at first. So when, especially because I was working with young, young kids, when they're acting out or um, lashing out, it usually there's usually a reason behind it that a need wasn't met um, in their de developmental years or a need is not currently being met at home. So the way that they're, when they're going to school and they can kind of relax, um, they're they're gonna react in certain ways because they feel safe. Um, and it's up to us as you know teachers and catechists to ensure that the child, whenever we're interacting with them, whether if, if it's we're teaching them or if we're disciplining them, um, I don't like to use the word discipline, but you understand what I mean, when we're um, correcting them, Yes. To make sure that they recognize that they are loved and that because we love them, we want to call them higher than they are currently at, regardless of the status they are in their lives. And that kind of framework continued when I was in Echo, like when I'm teaching middle school. Um, and especially middle school is a very tough year. Um just for people, I know the the people watching can probably be like, yeah, you know, middle school was, you know, yeah. a really, a really crazy year for me. I wouldn't want to relive it. <laughs> no. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what study there was. There was some study that I read that the the age that a, a child begins to either disaffiliate or grow deeper in their faith is age 13, which is eighth grade. Mm hmm um so especially as working with uh, junior high students in particular it's really incumbent on me to present the person of Christ to them not as both a just a really good moral teacher that just wants you to just be nice to people or at the same time a harsh judge and arbiter that will punish you if you make one mistake um but kind of like you know present to them the person of Jesus Christ who loves them with an everlasting love and at the same time calls them higher to be what his father has called them to be. So I think that is, yeah, that's the way that I approach um, faith formation because of my formation scene. Great. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so so part of your work in your, par you're working in a parish, yeah? Yeah, I'm a parish apprentice. Okay, so you're you're working in a parish. So you work with middle school work in faith formation. Okay. Yeah. So my my role is actually a little unique than most apprentices. Um, most apprentices will work in a variety of different ministries. They'll maybe work in RCIA, uh, 
religious ed but i i like to call it faith formation um maybe like different like young adult things um my situation was unique what insofar as excuse me um the person who was in charge of faith formation for junior high had left right as i was coming in so my parish was like oh gianna why don't you work with middle school um which when i was applying to seton i really wanted to work with middle school but i was placed in first grade so it was kind of like oh thank you i re i really want i really love working with older kids yeah um so for the past two years i've worked as the director of junior high faith formation so I make the curriculum and teach all of their faith formation classes. I run retreats. I organize and run like social events for them. I I'm basically like the DRE for um if for the folks at home that don't know that it's the director of religious education for junior high. Great. Yeah, so that 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 is a big responsibility, especially for someone in Echo. Um, you know, because our job really is to kind of see different facets, but uh, I, I think that's also a really good experience to to have that type of responsibility. So um, one of the things I was thinking, what, uh, what advice would you maybe give to somebody who's looking at applying to Echo? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I think it really depends on where you're, you're at in your state of life. Um, for me, because I had worked, um, I had worked after, after undergrad for a couple of years. I don't know if the folks at home are coming right out of undergrad or the folks at home are, um, have a few years of like work experience under their belts. Um, let me start, let me start with the first one. Um, some advice that I would give to you is when you're serving the church, I think the impression that is often given when you're first starting is that like, serving the church like I'm serving God and all these different things there's a very idealized way that we often take a look at it um and it's, it's very beautiful it's a very beautiful way of like kind of approaching it but especially in my experience in, in Seton and in, in here um in Echo the more that I have worked for the church the more that I have realized how broken she is and the more that I realized that my ministry is obviously bringing the light of christ to those who are either um economically or spiritually poor um but at the same time like really um diving into that brokenness of the church and um both having the confidence that you know the 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 church is truly instituted by christ because there is no way human powers and human forces would have kept this kept the show running for for 2000 years um but at the same time working towards um uh directing in not, not changing her that's not really what i mean but like directing the body of christ towards a fuller picture of what the church is meant to become um that's for the for the young young folks um for folks that have a couple of years under their belt um the thing that I had fo focused on was, you know, I really wanted to obviously, you know, get my master's in theology and and work and being Christian community. But there was there was a part of me that was like, uh, my vocation um, is to, you know, to to be a mother and a wife. And how is this program going to be conducive to that? Mm -hmm. Um and I'll be honest with you, I really want to be placed in New Jersey. I know a lot of Echoes have told me that New Jersey was their last, their like number eight placement, but I really, really wanted to be placed placed back home in New Jersey. Um, so I was just happy, I happened to be very lucky and I got placed uh, in New Jersey and placed in a diocese that I grew up in. So um, that does color my experience in Echo a little bit, but um I think for the for the older folks, I would say to focus on what is what is what is your vocation and how does Echo fit in that in that kind of vocational discernment, if at all, capital V vocation. So right, yeah, no, absolutely. I th I think I, I mean you and I were talking about this a little while ago, you know, before we started airing. But 
there's a few of us that definitely had work experience. And I think that was a question for a lot of us. And uh, that's a question for me too. Like I, I still contemplate it uh, once in a while. I'm like, well, you know, cause I, for the people here that know, I, uh, I taught for a year, but before that I was, I was in seminary. And so I had through that experience, I had already discerned that my, what I, I really do feel the Lord is calling me to is, is also marriage and, and fatherhood. Right. And so it was, how can this program build kind of around that. And I, I think part of the answer to that is maybe not the practical, like it's going to place you in a location, yada, yada, yada. But I think it's more of the, here's how you keep forming yourself. Here's how you learn to serve other people and put others needs at times in a, in a good, healthy way above your own, which is what any husband, father, mother, you know, wife need to do so i think the formation piece is probably what's been the biggest impact in that so um great so one other thing i just wanted to touch on um and and i want to play a quick game with you before we head out but you and i are also very interested in theology of the body yes so that was something i know you want to talk about and i really wanted to talk about uh, and I haven't really had much of a chance to talk about with anybody else on this chat yet. So where did you find it? How did you find it? What was the impact um, in, a, in a snippet? So I remember my spiritual director um, had mentioned different things about theology of the body. Um, she had given me like a little book that uh, Christopher West um had written called the eclipse about that's talking about the you know the culture's view on the body and different things like that and i, I had read it um really thought nothing of it um it wasn't until that i was seriously discerning um the vocation of marriage um that i was kind of like well why do i feel called to this um i don't feel called to religious life that's very certain in my heart but why do i feel called to marriage um and at least um, in my life, like, you know, my, my family is nominally Catholic, but they're not, um, I wouldn't say like, they're like Catholic, like a lot of Midwestern families are Catholic, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, so I remember my, one of my, one of my close friends, she had given me a, a bunch of books on marriage, um, whether it's married saints, um, different, different things like that of things that she prepared, read and prepared for when she got married, um. And the book that I came out was Good News on Sex and Marriage. And uh, it's like Christopher West's most famous book. Sure. Um, and the way that the book is for, uh, formatted is it's a question answer thing. Um, so I, I read the book and the way that he describes um, marriage um, and, and very broadly about, you know, the 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 sacredness and beauty of the body and the sacredness of uh of marriage and uh of sex it was it was so like uh revolutionary for me because I've never ever thought of it like that and you know taking taking away that the 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 marital aspect of it the the way that theology of the body speaks about and brings a positive light to the physical to the corporal um is something especially I feel like when I was being formed in college and even even um in in communities that I've been in the Bronx like the body was often talked about like you know you have to go away from the desires of the flesh and like it seemed like and, and this is not what the, the church believes of course but the erroneous belief that I had was that the soul is good the body is bad and the body is totally bad and you have to um purge every and all bodily desires kind of like it's like sort of like a stoic perspective there is a, another um is it manichaeism I, I don't know which heresy it is but there's something very there's a specific heresy that like says soul is good body is bad um, um I'm not too sure which one it is. I remember teaching on it last year and I, I'm blanking on it at the moment. Uh, Arianism, is it? it? It might be Arianism, um, some form of Arianism, but regardless. Sure. 
theology of the body like really changed the way that I I viewed myself as a woman um I viewed um my 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 vocation it just it was just so revolutionary and um part of my 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 capstone thesis is not explicitly on theology of the body but it takes elements of theology of the body so it's just it's just very very revolutionary and I encourage all people who haven't um read or encountered theology of the body um to really look into it it's like revolutionary it very much is great read very yeah very uh, light a light read very light read um the, the one piece of advice i would definitely give to people though when reading theology of the body uh it, i mean if that's what you come across first mm -hmm. great uh you know it, it definitely should but my suggestion would be read um read man women and the mystery of love and then read love and responsibility and then read tob just because those two books prior really lay down the academic language and set the foundation for when you get to theology of the body because jp2 starts talking about the word sign and he starts talking about other things that you're like what does this mean in this context but if you already have read that piece of things then you kind of have an idea going into the text so yeah and, and especially i think a piece of advice i would give for for that too is Theology of the body is very dense, and if you're not like well versed in like the theological language, like uh, sign and signifier, like it's gonna be like, what is he talking about? Even the word yeah. transcendent. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I think Christopher does a really good job, and in no way are they sponsoring this video and not. Yeah. You know, but um, so I want to make that very clear that that's not the case. But uh, I think Christopher West does a, and, and just the Theology of the Body Institute as a whole, I think they do a wonderful job as far as taking that text and taking that language and simplifying it to making it more broad and understanding to the, the, the wider community of people. So it's a really good job. Anyway, um, great. I just want to play a really quick game with you and then we'll kind of wrap things up here. Um, so I mentioned to you, I wanted to just ask you some questions, rapid fire questions, and I'm going to just give you a couple options and then I just want your response okay. as fast as possible. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. What was your favorite activity at Rutgers? Uh, oh my God. Uh, skipping class and going to the Catholic Center. <laughs> Good. Best food in New Jersey? Oh. My goodness, you can't tell, you can't ask me that question. Oh, uh, bagels. Random. What is it? Bagels. Sounds good. Uh, summer, fall, winter, or spring? Uh, fall. Favorite type of music? Uh, <laughs> um, I really like um Gregorian chant. I know that's that's such a basic answer. It's a great answer. It's a great answer. Favorite hobby? Favorite hobby drawing. Uh, favorite gospel currently? John. Favorite game growing up? Favorite game growing up? Uh, Kingdom Hearts. New York style pizza or New Jersey bagels? I like New Jersey bagels. I eat them more often. Saint, who you want to learn more about? Ooh, uh, Blessed Carl of Austria and Servant of God Zita. Perfect. North or South Dining Hall at Notre Dame? North Dining Hall. Current favorite passage? In scripture, what are your favorite passage in scripture? Um, I th behold, I make all things new. I think that's a uh, Revelation twenty one or twenty two. Best Echo Summer game or activity? Uh, best Echo Summer game or activity? Uh, that's a good question. Um, staying up late, not doing work, and just chatting about life with uh, my classmates. A city that you want to visit? Hmm. Madeira, Portugal. And who's your best friend from from the Bronx and Seton Teaching Fellows? Ooh, I think controversial, controversial. It's controversial. Um, I'm gonna get two. Um, Emily Amon or uh, Molly Wickham. Great. Like I said, to Emily, we love you, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> well, Gianna, thank you for taking 
uh, time out of your very busy day. Uh, it is a Friday. And so I, God bless you for taking this time. But I'm extremely grateful that we had this time uh, for this episode of Echoing Theology. So check it out. We're going to drop it Monday on the 18th. And I look forward to keep walking with this in this journey with you guys. So thank you. Bye-bye.